Annie Leibovitz is a photographer whose portraits have helped define the look of American popular culture over the last 20 years. In the 70s, she worked for Rolling Stone, helping to establish it as the style bible of the decade. Then, in the early 80s, demonstrating a keen intuition of trends, she moved to the newly relaunched Vanity Fair and found herself once more the star photographer of the style bible of the 80s. Many of her images, from John Lennon curled fetus-like with Yoko to a pregnant and naked Demi Moore, have been called, perhaps a little overexcitedly, icons of our time. But when the International Center of Photography in New York offered her a retrospective exhibition in 1991, she became the only living photographer, with the exception of Irving Penn, to have been given such an honor. Is it 16? 16 as in, uh, that's like a fish eye almost or something, no? No. Yes, it is. It, it, no, no, it's, it's just head and shoulders. Let's see. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> no, it isn't. Yeah, what are you doing? Work is really like a baby, you know, uh, that needs to be fed all the time. You know, it's it's something you have to take care of. It's um, it doesn't uh, take care of itself. You know, it doesn't happen, um, you know, by magic. And um, this year, with the book and the show, it's sort of like the baby graduated. <laughs> At the International Center of Photography, it was the most popular exhibition that we've ever had in our history which means it was more popular than Cartier-Bresson, it was more popular than a Man Ray fashion show we'd had a couple of years ago. I think there are two kinds of celebrity that are involved in Annie Leibovitz's work. One is the celebrities that she photographs and the other is her own celebrity. And I think it really plays into the way that Annie works and it also plays into the way that the sitter responds to the pictures and also the way that the viewer responds to the photographs. Where, where's my camera when I need it? I don't know. Gettysburg. No? No. Fort Augustine. No. <laughs> yes, um, again. Northern, Northern Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> Manassas. <laughs> My father was in the Air Force and uh, he traveled throughout the United States and he basically took us all with him and we basically just traveled the country and we couldn't afford to, to stay in hotels when we moved and we basically were all thrown in the backseat of the car and, and began to expect that as a way of life, you know, to move every two or three years. We were um, our own best friends because we traveled right. so much and we had to, you know, yeah. You had to befriend each other or else, although in the car at times, it was a hellion on yes, wheels. No. And you know what? What did you say when it got too heated? Remember, what did you say, Sam? I said, shut up. No. <laughs> he said, I'm going to stop this car. I'm going to pull this car hey, over it, to the it. side. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> Some more movies. I mean, there's a lot of excitement in sort of picking yourself up and moving. You know, you can, uh, you can change yourself. You got to see how a lot of people lived in so many different ways. And I got to see the country, and I fell in love with uh, the idea of, of, of looking out the window. And, you know, I look back at it now, and I realize what I'm doing. I basically had framed my life, you know, a lot of it through the windows of cars.
family basically is as close as one can get to another person and uh, have nothing to hide from each other. And, um, you know, when I first started doing portrait work and, and posing people, it was what I wanted from other people. It was what I thought would be the ultimate uh, situation is to have someone relax enough to, to just be themselves. There was one photograph in my grandmother's house of my mother's family arranged from youngest to the oldest. And they're on the Atlantic City boardwalk looking straight out at the camera. And it's taken by an anonymous photographer. The simplicity of it and the beauty of it, you know, and the composition. Um, I, I can see that photograph repeated, you know, in a lot of my work. The work has always been art to me, and um, you know, I, very early on, I used to, when I was uh, younger and more arrogant, uh, you know, I, I used to think that um, the, the people were very lucky to to be in my photographs. I mean, that the photograph was always the most important thing that I was doing. In 1968, she went to study painting at the San Francisco Art Institute. It really wasn't until I took a night class in photography and started to use the darkroom there and start to print that um, I was totally, you know, seduced by the darkroom, you know, by watching the magic of the work sort of come up in this kind of immediate way, you know. It was much faster than painting. I do enjoy the idea that the work goes over a period of time. It does reflect the times, for good or for bad. And it's done through these people that I you know, met along the way. I think the thing that's unique about the work is that it traces an aspect of American popular culture for the last 20 years. It, it is Obviously it deals with uh, politics. Uh, but in the very beginning parts of the work, in the, in, the, in the 70s, it's really based on the youth culture, strongly. In 1970, while still at art school, she took a portfolio of her work along to Rolling Stone magazine. Rolling Stone was then only three years old and rapidly gaining ground as the voice of the new youth culture, documenting everything from the contemporary music scene to drugs and politics. Her work was immediately accepted and by 1973 she'd officially become Rolling Stone's chief photographer. Well, Annie was, you know, one of the closest editorial collaborations I've ever had with anybody. Uh, and she... Um, you know, define the look, you know, help define the look and the style of Rolling Stone. And, you know, even though she hasn't worked steadily for us for 10 years now, somehow her spirit is still in it in a very serious way. I mean, I suppose half the public currently thinks that she still works for us. But that, that collaboration was really intense and very, very productive. I was looking to be adopted and, <laughs> and found, uh, you know, found Jan and Jane. You know, it turned into family for me. It was more than uh, you know, a magazine, it was a way of life. The first cover was actually one of the photographs from the Peace Rally. And it was a crowd shot, and they used it as an illustration for revolution in the country you know, at that time. It started as photojournalism. She'd go out on the road with rock and roll groups, or you know, go to uh, places, you know, we'd be covering a lot of cultural stuff at those times, or say, you know, religious, uh, you know, Maharishi, Maharishi type, you know, extravaganza, and she'd do that. Or Tom Wolf went to cover the astronauts and the launch of the Apollo, and she'd go along with Tom. You know, the campaign trail, the 1972 campaign, whatever we were doing, she was in the thick of it. I mean, she was working every day of the year. You know, those early years were really golden in the sense that that there was a lot of strength in, in, in being able to photograph without people thinking that you were doing anything. It was sort of like being invisible.
You know, I'm thinking back on Lennon, and Lennon was always like trying to put me at ease and trying to, you know, let me relax. I think I always looked so worried. There was a certain kind of, um, you know, well, let's let's help her out. <laughs> let's, let's just help her get through this or something like that. By the mid 70s, Rolling Stone embodied the spirit of a generation and provided a forum for writers as diverse as Tom Wolfe and Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter Thompson was a political journalist who had acquired cult status among the magazine's readers. Thompson and Leibovitz had a close and somewhat stormy relationship for many years. He now lived in seclusion in Woody Creek, Colorado. Zombies? <laughs> the 1970s? Yeah. Um, barely, man. I have so much brain damage, I can just barely remember the 80s. Or yesterday, for that matter. Well, it's, you know, like Annie, it's like one of these raw talents, you know, just full of energy. It's just almost explosive. That's horrible. And working with hunters has been at times a little bit like working with Annie, you know. So long hours, altered states of mind, you know, intense concentration, and just, you know, the enormous amount of fun. It happens every night. That's a neighbor's pig. Comes over and drives into the peacock cage. He gets caught in the uh, mechanical, what do you call it, nutcracker. He would get pissed as hell any time you know, he saw me. You know, it was like I would blow his cover. I mean, he just, he just felt he, he would come out at night and sort of lurk in the bars, and that's where he got his stories. He really I was a lone wolf and, and liked to prowl on his own. She was a photographer 25 hours a day. That's intolerable. I once burned her, all of her, <laughs> her film uh, in the fireplace there. And then she threw her Hasselblad into the fireplace. He had this habit of turning the lights off in the car so he could see the stars and the moon. And uh, we were driving up the highway, and he was driving what the police would call erratically. You know, he was changing lanes. So he got pulled over. And I remember Hunter yanking me out of the back saying, Annie, you have to take pictures. I realized I was in trouble. So I began yelling over the car. Uh, any of you bitch, get over here, bring that camera. Uh, and she responded, one of the great heroic acts of all time. She pulled herself together in this horrible mess plan frenzy. She brought the night gun out and took pictures. I did start to take pictures, and I was really surprised the policeman suddenly completely cooled off and got very nervous and, and, and did leave him alone. I felt as if I was in a very special place because, you know, I wasn't being told what to go out and see. I basically had to go out and see what I saw, and it was really impressionistic, you know, whatever um, I came back with, you know, usually ran. And there were a lot of times that the pictures uh, were, were the crutch for the magazine. You know, they didn't have a story and they just ran the pictures. You know, that was, of course, true with Hunter filing for Nixon leaving the White House. Mistakes, yes, but for personal gain, never. Gone, but not forgotten. Missed, but not mourned. We will not see another like him for quite a while. He was dishonest to a fault. The truth was not in him. And if it can be said that he resembles any other living animal in this world, it could only have been the hyena. I couldn't compete with the White House press corps. I couldn't compete with the big photographers because they were in the place they had to be to get the picture at the moment. I had to wait till, till the crowd had left and, and then I took my picture of some sort of detail. And to see those, those details sort of blown up large in the magazine, they were very powerful.
In 1975, when Mick Jagger asked me to, to be the tour photographer, I jumped at it. You know, I, I remember Jan Winter said to me that he couldn't guarantee that, that I would have a job when I came back to Rolling Stone if I, if I did this. And uh, he was not very happy about me going off to do it. She actually came on the whole tour, which is like a very long time to, um, to want to photograph a band. I really didn't know how music was made. In fact, when I started on the tour, I brought my tennis racket with me. And I was thinking that as we went from city to city, I was going to take a tennis lesson. You know? Everyone was like looking at me like I was totally nuts. Of course, you know, nights turned into uh, days, and uh, you know, I was never seen in the daytime again. Sort of, it turned to a vampire. She was so bored after a while of photographing the Rolling Stones. You know, there's only so much she can do. And um, I think that's what drove her to feminism. But anyway, uh, she's, <laughs> she said, I keep looking at you guys' cocks all the time. I just keep looking at your cocks. <laughs> but <laughs> she, uh, when she'd finished doing that, she used to photograph the, the audience. And I think there's a, some good pictures of that period when she does all these audience snaps, which in some ways are just as interesting, not more so than the band. I became very interested in the audience. I would spend a lot of time wandering through the audience and looking at the audience. And I would watch people sort of give themselves up. I didn't see the photograph as adulation. I actually saw it as desperation. People sort of smashed against a chain link fence. It was very poetic, you know, um, but it looked very painful to me. It's very difficult to photograph music. It's, it's something in the air. But you can uh, photograph the energy and you know, what it takes. You know, I don't think anyone realizes the kind of strain one is on when they're on stage. I like to call it my Francis Bacon, you know, because it has a very gory quality to it. In a certain way, I was trying to show uh, that, that life on the road was not glamorous, you know, that the idea of propelling one's body through space a lot faster than it's meant to go um, took its toll. And their lifestyle, you know, it was a very hard lifestyle. And, um, you know, I was trying to, to show, uh, to try to de-romanticize it, you know, to, to, to show a side that was not so pretty. Gotta sleep like an angel, gotta be not good. Gotta sleep like an angel. This is a photograph taken of Keith Richards, actually done for the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Keith Richards was in Toronto uh, for a drug charge, and he was waiting to go to court. And this is the, the portable studio that I set up in his hotel room. It's a good example of you know, my crude lighting. Um, he's taking a little break in between the, the photo shooting. It wasn't very work orientated, uh, and there was a lot of um, sort of hanging out, and so on, so on, taking drugs and so on, all that sort of thing. More so, perhaps, in the 60s, or just different drugs from the 60s. So it was that era, and yeah, I think that that, that Annie did a lot of pictures that. Um, remember that or reflect that when you look at them. I think she was very um, aware of all that. I mean, she was very much part of it. Um, she was a sort of hands-on. She wasn't like a f so much as a fly in the wall as kind of a one of the guys, you know, taking part in everything. She liked to be one of the guys. You know, I basically gave myself up to whatever w was going on and felt that that was what one did as a as a um, as a journalist or as a uh, you know in that kind of reportage work that in order to get the best work you had to sort of totally be involved and um, people talk about the soul of the sitter but there's also the the soul of the photographer and you know I basically almost lost you know my soul I mean it wasn't the Rolling Stones. 
fault. You know, it was it was my fault for allowing myself, you know, to give myself up. You know, to go to go in something so deeply that, you know, I let it, you know, overtake me. wonderful way to be a photographer is, is to watch life unfold in front of you. But it got to be that I would walk into a room, and after this is after you know four or five years, three or four, five years working for Rolling Stone, and it, and my subject, who would be who's supposed to be really in my frame, is suddenly walking up to me, and my frame is you know getting in, and and saying, oh hi Annie, how are you? What's going on? And it and it and the dynamics changed. I could no longer be, um, you know, just sort of invisible. I mean, suddenly your subject was sort of, not only was he, you know, sitting there talking to you, you know, and not being involved in his life so that you could just photograph whatever was going on, you know, he was suddenly saying, what do you want me to do? You know, and that sort of, I don't know, what do you, I mean, what, what are you doing? Or, you know, I mean, it's, and, um, you know, I think that I became more comfortable with something that sort of said, this was posed and this is set up. She was doing some kind of seduction. There was something about her personality that was so strong and, and compelling that people would do things for her that they wouldn't do for other photographers. So Rolling Stone had pictures that no one else had. And that was something that, that the combination of her and her proximity to these people Getting these pictures in the magazine became a kind of cycle so that more and more she was the star, the, she, the picture was the, the, the kind of performance. I started to think of ways to make the cover portrait something more than just um, a face looking out at you. I, I liked when, when photographs. Um, even the pose pictures told you a little story or gave you a little more information. That's when I did Steve Martin against the Franz Klein painting, Bette Midler and the Roses, um, you know, Clint Eastwood, you know, tied up. Lennon was brought to the emergency room at the Roosevelt site, St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital, this evening, shortly before 11 p.m. He was dead on arrival. And I guess it was their last, you know, official photo session, and you know, by you know that kind of horrible, horrible accident of fate, uh, you know, within hours he was murdered. You know, in retrospect, that picture looks, you know, like a return to the womb, you know, preparation for death. Uh, so, it, you know, it's got, it, uh, it's got tremendous resonance and, you know, it's evocative of a really powerfully emotional time. It's a very powerful picture, a very powerful image, and, and it's certainly one of the, you know, Annie's great classics. What was unusual is, is I imagined both of them nude together, and at the last minute, Yoko didn't want to take her clothes off. She said she was willing to take her shirt off, but not her pants, and I was really disappointed and just said, oh, we'll just leave everything on. And of course, it was much stronger to see John nude and very vulnerable. When we shot the first Polaroid and I, and I peeled it and he looked at it, he was very, very excited. You know, he said, you know, this is our relationship. Once John died, I mean, no question that we were going to use it. And then went further and decided it just didn't need any headlines at all. So it was the one issue of Rolling Stone ever that we put out that had no type on the cover, except the logo. Despite her continuing professional success throughout the late 70s, her drug addiction was becoming increasingly debilitating. Those times were a little crazy. I mean, it was the peak of the drug times, and um, pretty much everybody we were covering and everybody we were working with was taking drugs, you know, in one form or another. And, you know, it just got, you know, kind of crazier and crazier, and Annie got into it perhaps a little heavier than most. 
Um, and after a while, I sort of just kind of took over and I started managing her and her managing the drugs. And um, uh, it led to some pretty rough times. There is this myth that you have to be in a lot of pain, you know, to be working. And, and I, I think I certainly fell into that that category of thinking that uh, um, it, it did make it, in a certain way, you know, easier to work because you really didn't have to have a life, you know. Um, it took care of uh, any other needs, you know, that, that you had. You know, finally came to a place where it was just best for us to kind of part ways at the end and, and get her out of the milieu that might have encouraged her to take drugs and also get um, uh, our operations back on a more even keel and, you know, and get off that roller coaster that Annie had become. It took me years to to come back to myself. Yeah. You know, and, and you're not yourself. You're a little bit more uh, battle worn. But uh, you know, no. Amazingly enough, uh, I, I did continue to work. You know, uh, I'm, I think it's it's what really saved me. Right. Um, do you want to get together a little bit before the Twilight Art meeting just to discuss what you know I'm going to discuss? And yes, I'll be in the studio. You in 1981, Annie Leibovitch joined the newly relaunched Vanity Fair. The magazine was in the ascendance and rapidly becoming the magazine of the 80s. A generation of Rolling Stone readers had come of age and they now had money and power. Hi, Bernice. Hi, Okay. Before she came to Vanity Fair, she was beginning to be somewhat pigeonholed as a kind of cult photographer of rock and roll burnout case. And when she joined Vanity Fair, that was really the image of her that people had, that she was the person who was there at the very last minute of a Stones tour when everybody was strung out, and then she'd get her fantastic shot. What she's been able to do since joining Vanity Fair is really grow and evolve and develop as a photographer in terms of her subject matter as much as her technique. So that now you'll see Annie doing a portfolio like her Watergate portfolio, where she went back and photographed all the protagonists of Watergate, or the Hall of Fame, which she does every Christmas, in which she will do anybody from Havel to the head of uh, Fox Studio. Uh, it's not just simply performers, it's not just rock and roll. She really has a much, much wider spectrum to do. In a portfolio that has produced many memorable images, her cover for Vanity Fair last August became her most notorious photograph. Demi Moore, eight months pregnant and naked, sparked a storm of controversy that was taken up by the media across America. When we got there that day, the one thing that I had said to Lori Goldstein, who was the stylist, is that I felt very sexy and that I wanted to portray that in the photographs that I said I, I think you should go and get beautiful lingerie black lingerie and I want to depict how I really am feeling and how sexy I think the pregnant body is and and a woman in that time and so it wasn't as if we came up with some big you know revelatory idea it was just like the most natural thing for us to do and I wasn't even really thinking of it as a cover of that. And then as we were in the position, I looked up and I said, Danny, wouldn't it be great if they used this for the cover? And then we all kind of looked at each other and said, there's no way. There's no way they're going to do it. As soon as Annie brought the shoot back, I knew that it should be the cover. It felt to me a really groundbreaking celebrity picture. To me, it completely defined celebrity in the 90s. Its image just said everything. It said 
the rejection of glitz, it said Hollywood being sort of self-parodic almost for once. It's it said um, it said babies, which is what everybody's talking about. The furor over Vanity Fair's cover continues to grow. The nation. Tina Trump Brown issued North Carolina a statement today from the denying shows. that the photograph is offensive. When our rate manager told reporters, we are a family store, cover and this cover is obscene. I couldn't take it too seriously to begin with, and I realized that I, I um, you know, that it was too important of a photograph to a lot of women. I had to, to understand that a little better myself, you know. I didn't know what I'd, what I'd done. I think that the taboo is that women can't exude that they've had sex in any way to have gotten in this shape. I mean, you know, you think of even how women are, you know, supposed to dress when they're pregnant, and it's very covered, very hidden. It's all very well to do a very controversial cover, but if nobody can buy it, um, you've got a great cover that, that, that bombs. And uh, our publisher actually came up with the idea of putting it in a, in a brown wrapper that month, in a wraparound thing. And of course, um, I was just obsessed with how no one could then see it, which really worried me. But of course, I underestimated the American obsession with, uh, with forbidden fruit. And of course, as it un uh, unfolded, it began to seem uh, as if this was the best thing we could have possibly done. I don't think that any photograph in memory has had that kind of impact. I mean, we were on the front page of every single newspaper from one end of America to the other, plus Japan, South America, Germany. I mean, it was quite remarkable. The Demi Moore cover was considered a success because it raised so many eyebrows and it, and it put a uh, semi-nude pregnant woman on the front of a mass media magazine. But I think, I think the the, the problem with a photograph like that was, was actually well stated by someone who works at Vanity Fair, who was congratulated on the photograph and the impact the cover had made, and they said, well, thanks very much, but what do we do next? And there's, there's this element to Annie Leibovitz's photography where you're always faced with this issue. What's, how is she going to, how is she going to top this? Obviously, any cover that plays against August of last year when Demi was on was going to have a tough time competing with her figures. So I felt it would be entertaining and amusing and kind of self-referential in a, in, a, in a kind of droll way to put her on again, uh, showing how great she looked afterwards. Annie and her team of assistants arrive in Los Angeles for a three-day shoot, having already spent four days in Hawaii filming Demi Moore on the beach. They're still in search of the definitive cover shot, and the shoot looks likely to become one of the most expensive in Vanity Fair's history. Uh, okay, I'll move the <laughs> I was just wondering if they said anything about the baby at all. No, my message was that Demi and the baby were showing up. Because, you know, we're having problems with her wanting the baby photograph. Uh -huh. I can't see doing it with, without the baby, you know, it's just, that's the cover to me. Yeah. But if you think there's a basic problem about using the baby anyway, in any kind of form or something, then I think, you know, even if you're not seeing the baby's face, then I think we're in a little bit of trouble. I think we're going to have to talk about it, you know, in some way or another, because, uh, you know, I was kind of hoping just to go ahead shoot a little, look at it, and hope that everyone would, you know, love us so much, you know. Nowadays, in the 90s, just getting in to get the time of the star, getting approval to use the pictures and, and able to uh, get, get the right to use them on the cover is really increasingly hard. I mean, the stars are deciding their own if, image. Demi comes to Bruce's shootings and Bruce comes to Demi's shootings, and I just know that we always do some extra little stuff for ourselves. We always do that. And I love them, so. <laughs> she's very, very hard working. She's fantastically um, perfectionist, I think. She would get so furious if, you, if something went slightly wrong. And, but she would really push the subject to the point of torture, I think, almost. Actually, it can come, come, come yeah. over a little more. Okay, wait, wait. What I wanted to do is wanted to slide it. Right there? 
There. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Amy's like a person who's always searching for a new idea. She thinks intensely about what she's doing. And she won't take no for an answer. She will get what she wants. Okay. 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 So you think, would you call me when you're leaving Denise? Okay, good, bye. When we look at her photographs, her best photographs, we feel we're being led into some secret about the star's nature, that perhaps the normal photographs in People magazine or the normal celebrity media don't give us in the same way. Uh, and I think part of the attraction to celebrity, and this is perhaps uh, her great intuition as a photographer and as a member of the celebrity culture and the celebrity media, her great intuition is that we always want to know something secret about the star. A dozen South Central L.A. gangs are gathering right now in the Athens area, looking for an end to all the violence. Yesterday, gang members held four different meetings throughout Los Angeles to talk over it. There are problems with the baby shoot. Bruce Willis, Demi's husband, doesn't want the baby's face to be given public exposure, so the search for an eye-catching image to match last year's cover continues. A new day dawns, and with it, a new concept. Nudity with a twist. That's an interesting way to do it. <laughs> do you really do it that way? Yeah, I guess you do. We had two state beaches that are unreserved for us. We have five homes in Bel Air, unreserved for us. We have four mobile homes sitting around, unreserved for us. You know, we have three hotels. We have four hotel rooms standing by, pre-lit for us. Because you just never know what's going to happen. Right now, um, Demi's being painted. She has her shirt and her tie painted. and. And we're painting her head to toe. Ooh, my funky red slippers. Oh, so I always see her in a more classical sense. You know, I, I think she's a very classical beauty, and she's always wanted to sort of go out there on the edge, and uh, it's just something she's always wanted to do. Wait a second, Natalie. Let's try a couple things. The pressure grows as Annie and her crew wait for Demi to emerge from the dressing room. The body painting, which began at 6 in the morning and was expected to take only 7 hours, is stretching to 13. It's now late afternoon and not one frame of Demi has been filmed. It's frustrating because I didn't know that we had to be out of here by 8.30. I didn't know we had to be out of here at, you know, 8.30 until about, you know, 20 minutes ago. And the uh, hairdresser has to leave at 7 and... I found out about that, you know, halfway through today, so... As time goes by today, there's less and less time to shoot. It's the normal thing, the normal frustrating thing. I look like a leftover suit. You feel, how do you feel? Do you want to try the wall? Do you want to pick it up? I'll just hold this. I want, I, I was going to, Try you all the way against the wall. Maybe that's a kind of crucial image for all of Annie Leibovitz's uh, photographs, that these celebrities are photographed, or if you will, painted and naked at the same time. They seem to be naked, but they're actually painted. Uh, they seem to be natural, but they're actually stylized and theatricalized. One of the things that Annie brings to any magazine photograph, really, is a kind of intense hyper-realism. Her pictures have a kind of electric energy. She brings an extra-dimensional thing to her pictures, where people seem sort of larger than life in many ways. Annie's sense of aesthetics has to do with handsome. It's not about pretty, and it's not about uh, 
uh, a certain surface beauty or exquisiteness. It's about very robust strength and a kind of well-balanced proportion and health, which is a very American sense of aesthetics. You know, the 80s become more conceptual and more fat and more saturated, you know, and uh, contrived and rich. And, and, it's, and it's, uh, it feels like the 80s before the recession, <laughs> you know. Annie's portrait of Donald and Ivana Trump was a quintessential 80s photograph. Highly celebratory of celebrity glitter, really. The most interesting thing about a person can be that they're famous. And sometimes it's the least interesting thing about them. The surface can be as fascinating as the interior. And I think that the surface says a lot about our times and about the person. She's photographing these celebrities for a for a magazine designed to, as in effect, promote them. So she automatically has a number of constraints placed upon her as an artist, the main one being that she cannot photograph them in a way that undercuts uh, our notion of who they are, our notion of their importance. So what this means is that she's essentially a, a part of the part of the large public relations uh, machine that these stars, these celebrities, um, have working for them and around them. You're always in a confrontational situation with publicists in regard to stars. The great thing about Annie is that Annie is her own person, and if I can get Annie accepted by the stars agent. <laughs> then I know I'm going to get a great shot because Annie Actually, won't put up with any nonsense. Her interest is in getting a memorable shot and it isn't necessarily the shot that the star would pick. <laughs> it's only recently that we've had this cult of the art photographer so that the work that Edward Steichen did for Vogue, the work that Man Ray did for Vanity Fair and Harper's Bazaar, at the time it was a way of making a living for those photographers. At a time it was seen in being in the commercial area but once distance is brought to bear on it, it becomes a very accurate barometer of that time period and of that culture of that time. And very quickly then it begins to move in the can into the canon of art photography. So it's a very slippery issue. It's a very slippery issue. And I think time will tell what categories we can accurately put these into. Clearly, they're made within the context of mass culture. Sorry, that's, a little, that's scary. I'm sorry, I did not do that. <laughs> I think that it's a society that's totally lost its bearings in terms of what its values are, and so it's putting all its value into uh, celebrity. There's such a, a lack of, 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 of spiritual self-confidence, perhaps, that uh, the achievers seem to have uh, to be the kind of the, 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 the sort of the holy the holy cows that people worship. What we do at Vanity Fair is to use the celebrity cover image as a form of packaging, and inside we can do anything we like. There are times when the event is is actually more exciting than the photograph. And that always sort of throws me off, like the Keith Haring photograph, for example. It's just sort of a, a, a little bit of light compared to what it was like to actually be there and watch him paint the room. At the end of this shooting, I asked him if he'd ever painted himself. And he said he'd be willing to try. You know, watched him paint his whole body, and it was really beautiful to see him put that long line on his penis to make it look longer. <laughs> and, and he stood in front of the, the backdrop, and I mean, it was just amazing because he just disappeared. He totally disappeared. He felt completely dressed, and he wanted to go do something. And I suggested that we go to Times Square. So we hopped out of the car in the middle of Times Square, and no one's paying us any bit of attention. As if, you know, there was a painted man in Times Square every night. In 1987, when American Express gave her a three-year commission to produce a series of portraits for them, she found that she finally had the resources and time to bring her work to a new level of technical perfection. 
I brought the American Express work to such a point that I started to not like it because some of it starts to look extremely slick and, um, dare I say, you know, commercial. I mean, part of, I think, what was interesting about some of the early work is that it isn't perfect. There is mistakes in it. In the late 80s, she photographed Susan Sontag for her book AIDS and its Metaphors, and Sontag became a close companion and mentor. She's helped me a great deal in the last few years um, in the direction of the work. You know, I think she's really responsible for, for uh, you know, my push back into the dance work and, um, uh, and, and the idea of working more, you know, for myself. look back over the years and, and look at the work, I can see that I'm pulled back and seeing the full body uh, most of the time. You know, that um, I've always been interested in, in the form of the body. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the background of my mother, you know, it, it became quite natural to, uh, to be interested in dance. Oh, that's nice. me dancing. You know, my mother, uh, before she met my father, was a dancer. She took lessons from Martha Graham. It's a wonderful stripped down sense to work with, especially as a portrait photographer, because you're working with body language and, and, and sort of very raw emotional forms. and. Uh, and then the dancer is expressing himself in, in a silent way with, with, his, with his body. And, um, and, it, and I think it feeds back quite nicely into you know, the portrait work. I mean, I, I look at, at how people uh, sit and, and what they do with themselves in, in a more uh, um, studied way. You know. In 1991, Mikhail Boryshnikov and Mark Morris invited Annie to document the creation of the White Oak Dance Project in Florida. This was taken towards the end of my stay at White Oak. It's such an extraordinary idea, actually, for the dancer. You know, that they are sort of spending their lives trying to leave their feet, more or less. And what was interesting about being underwater is they were basically set free. I'm trying to, um, to work through some ideas on my own and, and actually go out and, and you know, self-assign myself, which is which is relatively new for for myself. But I, I I know that photography is much larger and grander than than just magazines. <laughs> but the work in general has been the assignment work for the magazines, and and I have basically followed their lead. You know, I mean, the, first with Rolling Stone and then Vanity Fair, and it's been an interesting journey. It's interesting to see who's supposed to be the person of the moment to record, you know, the people of our time. I'd like to try. Let's, let's get the cameraman in. Can you come in? Yeah. And can we get the salmon, salmon in there, too? You want them in the shot, right? Yeah. yeah you can come in even closer. Come in even closer. But no, to That's good. this way. To the side. To the side. Actually, sideways. have to forget about getting Annie in. <laughs> so the mic in a little more. You guys get to be props now. Me? Okay. That is great. Let's hang in there for a few. Just double check my exposure, please. Okay, well, uh, bring the mic to the side. It's great, it's great, it's great. Put your legs a little closer together, let's see. This looks incredible. It's great. This is really nice. Okay, bring that camera to the side again, Mike. Stay real tight. Stay tighter, tighter, tighter. Okay, actually it'd be better to get the camera on the other side. Uh... 